Welcome to Follow Him, a weekly podcast dedicated to helping individuals and families with their Come Follow Me study. I'm Hank Smith. And I'm John, by the way. We love to learn. We love to laugh. We want to learn and laugh with you. As together, we follow Him. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Follow Him. My name is Hank Smith. I am your host. I am here with my indomitable (laughs) co-host, John, by the way. (laughs) Um, We want to mention um, that you can find us on social media. Please uh, come over to our Instagram, Facebook accounts. Uh, You can get our you can get show notes and transcripts at followhim.co, not com, John. Follow him. Dot just co, dot co. Mm-hmm. Just co, dot co. And of course, we'd love for you to rate and review our podcast. Uh, that makes us very happy when we get good reviews. Um, John, <laughs> who's with us today? Yes. And we're, I'm so excited about this because we had so much uh, wonderful feedback when we had uh, Barbara Morgan Gardner on before. And I, last time I read a bio from the BYU website. This time I'm going to read one from the back of her book. It's a little shorter, if that's okay, Barbara. Great. Um, The Priesthood Power of Women in the Temple, Church, and Family. And this was, oh, I want to look this up real quick, published in 2019. So it's kind of hot off the press. Barbara Morgan Gardner is an associate professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. She holds a master's degree in education leadership and foundations and a PhD in instructional psychology. And she did postdoctoral work at Harvard University. She was institute director in Boston, Massachusetts, serving more than 100 universities and colleges in the area and acting as chaplain at Harvard and MIT. She continues to serve as the chaplain at large in higher education for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She also serves on the BYU Interfaith Outreach Council. She and her husband, Dustin Gardner, live in Utah, and we're, we're really so excited to have you back. Welcome. Thank you for coming back. Thanks. It's a, such a pleasure to be here with you guys. My life is better being with you. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> we're grateful you would associate with us, Barbara. <laughs> it's rough. It's rough, yeah. but I'm willing. <laughs> um, uh, John, that book, uh, what's the title of it again? Um, it's called The Priesthood Power of Women. And Barbara didn't ask us to do this, but I just want to say <laughs> this book has changed a lot of lives. Uh, yeah. I just, just giving people... Uh, it, well, I think it was Elder President Oaks who said he is, his favorite talks were so, was when someone took an old topic that he already knew about and showed him new things about it. Well, the priesthood is an old topic in the church, but Barbara will show you new things. And, and, and it's page after page of new things you've never known. So um, we're just going to throw the follow him stamp of approval on... <laughs> on uh, On her book. I think what you're saying, I like how you said that, Hank, but it's kind of like you read something and you go, you just go, oh, well, of course, I should have known that type of a thing. And it settles inside. I like that. That's it helps, you know, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So sorry to uh, gush there, Barb. A little bit. Well, just... <laughs> thank you. It's I never intended to write a book. I was a, I was I was intending to help people find answers to questions and help them stay strong and active in the church and understand the priesthood, especially how it relates to women. And the book, the book ended up being the result. Just kind of formed out of that. Yeah, a lot of books start that way. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's jump into our lesson this week, Barb. Um, we have a single section. Uh, we are in section 84 um, of the Doctrine and Covenants. Why don't we back up as much as you want? When I think about section 84, having taught seminary and institute at BYU, that when I think of this section, I immediately think priesthood. I mean, it says right in the section heading, this is a revelation on priesthood. And so um, traditionally, anytime we're talking about a revelation on priesthood, we, we, we have thought of men. Um, and, there, and there's a reason for that as well in section 84, because this section actually comes in, in September of 1832. And just nine months earlier, in January of 1832, Joseph receives a revelation and he sends from the Lord, and he's sending all these mission, 24 different missionaries throughout the United States. And if you guys remember just a few sections earlier, we had these, these missionaries just listed one by one, and here's your companionship, and this is where you're going, and sometimes good luck and figure out where you're going. But now <laughs> these missionaries have all returned 
And they are in Kirtland with Joseph Smith now, and they're basically kind of giving their missionary homecoming discussion with the prophet. And so it's in this setting that Joseph is going to receive this revelation now known as Revelation on Priesthood. It's important to know, though, that this revelation, section 84, is actually a compilation of three revelations. So it's received on September 22nd and then 23rd. Joseph calls it again in the section heading, it's a season of joy. But actually what you're seeing is three revelations eventually tied together. So the first part of this revelation, section 84, goes from um, about verses 1 through, gosh, the, about through the oath and covenant of the priesthood. So you're going to be looking at 1 through about 43, 44. And then the next two revelations are going to be received the next day, and they're going to finish up the rest of this section. So a lot of times when we look at this, there's a, there's a, there's kind of a, a break in this section as you're reading it. And that's actually purposeful because it is three revelations combined into one. So Joseph's receiving this revelation in front of all these elders. And, and it's, it's interesting because you have the writings of, of some of them later saying, this is what we saw. We saw Joseph's countenance and they describe his cadence and, and how everything was, was being received by the Lord. But none of them were actually writing it down. So in the process, Oliver Cowdery comes in and he sees this revelation taking place. And he's like, wait, is, is anybody <laughs> writing this down? Because this sounds pretty important. Nobody was. And so at that point, <laughs> Oliver kind of takes up his pen and starts being the scribe for this revelation. Or I say somebody, these revelations. Yeah. Somebody should do some writing. <laughs> That's so yeah. funny. All right. Um, and you were going to, you, you tie this usually to section 75. Isn't that right? I, I tie this section to many sections of the Doctrine okay. and Covenants. I mean, if, if hmm. I were to look at the Doctrine and Covenants and I were to say, okay, what do you need to know in preparation for this revelation? What sections should you read before, before you read this? I, I would say strongly that you need to read section two, because section two is going to be talking about Elijah and the temple and, and the work of sealing. You need to read and understand section 13, because now we're talking about the priesthood being restored, right? Um, we, could, we could read section 25, which President Nelson told the women of the church to study as they're trying to understand more about priesthood. Uh, you could read section 27. I mean, you could go on and on. You could read section 36, where the temple is, is first mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants. And then 38, where we're talking about being endowed with power. I mean, there's so many. Section 76, you're talking about the great vision. Uh, then 82, right before this, is going to be a great revelation. Also is going to be mentioning priesthood and Zion and temple work. But then this section, and the reason why I bring up all those other sections before this, is because this section is a temple section. So when I teach this and when I study this, it's, it's absolutely imperative that we understand that Joseph Smith was receiving revelation regarding the temple. So if you see right off the bat, verse one, we're seeing that he's talking to these six elders, but verse two, we're seeing Mount Zion and new Jerusalem. Then you turn the page. This new Jerusalem is going to be built on the temple lot. That's verse three. Then verse four, you see even the place of the temple, which temple shall be reared in this generation. And then you start seeing verse five built into the Lord, the Lord's house. And you continue on this. And then it talks about this holy priesthood. So it's absolutely imperative that we're talking about this holy priesthood, that we understand that we're talking about the patriarchal order of the Melchizedek priesthood. So often we talk about the administrative function of the priesthood, and that's going to be section 18 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where we're talking about the first presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve and the administrative function. That's Peter, James, and John coming to Joseph Smith, right? And, and revealing or giving to him the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood. This priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood, the keys are going to be received in the Kirtland temple. And so this is going to be following this revelation where Joseph receives these keys. It's a patriarchal order of the priesthood referring to husband and wife, women and men going to the temple and receiving um, their, their priesthood together as President Benson would talk about. I've, I've heard you talk about this before, that there's two, not two priesthoods, but two priesthood, what did you... Structures I, per se. Two yeah, priesthood so structures. structures. Yeah. yeah. I just for right now, I think it's important that we just understand that there are two priesthood structures. Adam and Eve um, go, enter into the patriarchal order of the priesthood. This highest order of the priesthood continues on from Abraham to Sarah, and then it continues on through Moses. And as we know from the book of Exodus, and we're going to see this in this section as well, when you look at verse 23, for example, he talks about this priesthood and he says, Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God, but they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. 
Therefore, the Lord in his wrath for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of his glory. Therefore, he took Moses out of their midst and the holy priesthood also. So we're referring specifically to this holy priesthood. It's the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood. It's the patriarchal order of the priesthood. So we have to understand going into this section that this patriarchal order of the priesthood was taken away from the people during the time of Moses. It returns again during the time of Christ, although during the time of Christ, according to Elder McConkie, Christ set up his church in the administrative or hierarchical function of the priesthood. Or in other words, he has first presidency, quorum of the twelve, so it's a hierarchical function structure. In the patriarchal order, you're going to see family. You're going to see Old Testament. You're going to see more temple. When you're talking about administrative or or ecclesiastical function, you're going to see a first presidency, a quorum of the 12, and you're going to see bishops and in our day, state presidents. So when Joseph Smith is now restoring the gospel of Jesus Christ, he is receiving both simultaneously. He's receiving the hierarchical or administrative order of the priesthood. He's going to be called as, as the prophet of the church, first presidency, quorum of the 12 are going to be established, etc. But he's also going to be told by the Lord that they need to gather Israel and that they need to move to the Ohio. And the purpose of moving to the Ohio is to be gathering and establishing the temple there. And he's going to do the same thing as he's moved into Missouri. And then the temple is going to actually be built. And the endowments are going to be received in the Kirtland Temple. So there are two administrative structures, structures of the church that are going to overlap, which is why in our day, you see the public is going to be the administrative. And you're going to see more of the private, which is the patriarchal. And it's, and it's the, the temple. So I should, in my mind, I'm trying to, I'm, I, I, I'm, a, I'm not slow, but I, I, I just got to make sure I get it. Yes, I there's feel a like lot I'm here. Saying, yeah, yeah, I feel like I, there's, a, there's a priesthood structure that runs the church. Yep. And then there's a priesthood structure that is going to be involved in my home and marriage and my temple covenants. And I can, it, knowing me, I could probably get those confused and I bet people do that sometimes. Easily. Yeah. In fact, Elder Baller, one of the things that he talks about is, is that the, the church right now is the scaffolding. What we had in the pre-mortal life is going to be the patriarchal heavenly father and heavenly mother, heavenly parents reign in this pre-mortal world. Uh, what we have on the earth is a structure of church that is supposed to be for the purpose of strengthening the family. What you see in the home is a patriarchal priesthood structure, right? So President Oaks talks about how there's a difference between how the priesthood functions at church and how priesthood functions in the family. And that becomes extremely important. And then in this, this life, we have a priesthood structure that's public. President um, Ballard would say that this is, this is a scaffolding right now that in the eternities we will be using uh, the order of the priesthood, patriarchal priesthood. And this scaffolding right now is to help us prepare to live in families for eternity. Um, you, we already kind of started there in verse in verse two. Uh, we talk about temple, and and I think also as as we talk about this, uh, you know, a lot of people there. I shouldn't say a lot. There are a number of people who struggle with the idea of women and priesthood, and and this becomes extremely important because as we understand the the role of priesthood and understand those different priesthood structures, it helps answer a lot of the questions that people have. So today we don't have time to go into all the all of the intricacies of this, but, but for a simple answer to a lot of these, as President Packer says, true doctrine understood changes attitude and behavior. And I am one who, who studied the doctrine of the priesthood for many reasons, but one very important reason was because I heard enough people that were confused and disgruntled that I knew if they truly understood the doctrine of the priesthood, they wouldn't be. That's just, that's just kind of my philosophy. There may be some, but the majority are going to say, oh my goodness, I had no idea. Women really do have priesthood power. Women really do have priesthood authority. They aren't ordained to a priesthood office in the church structure, but when they enter the temple and they receive their endowments, when they make covenants with the Lord, they are endowed with priesthood power and priesthood authority. And understanding the difference between those two priesthood structures answers many questions that women have. So when, when a woman says, yes, when I go home and, and somebody will say, aren't you so sad that you don't have the priest in your family? And she's a single woman, as President Nelson said recently, she says, oh, actually, I, I do. I do have the priest in my family. If a, a mother, for example, her, her husband may be gone and the, the, there's a son who's been ordained to a priesthood office and let's say he holds the Aaronic priesthood, uh, who presides in the family? Well, when the husband's gone, the mother, of course. She is presiding because she's the mom. Uh, she has made covenants with the Lord. And even if she hasn't made covenants with the Lord, the relationship between a husband and wife puts them in a, in a, in a, in a leadership position with mm -hmm. the children. 
So, so understanding a lot of these things answers the questions of presiding, answers the questions of power and authority, why we do these things but also helps us understand um, that the purpose of the priesthood is for the salvation of souls, that it's not a, it's not a, a war or a battle between men and women. It's a synergistic approach that God has given to women and men in this church to unite together for the purpose of bringing all of our brothers and sisters back to our heavenly parents. So when we understand the priesthood and the responsibility behind it, all of us then are working together for the same purpose, which is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of all of God's children. That's the purpose of the priesthood. I love that. I've got two sisters who are single parents and it's happened. It's been said to them many times, right? Um, you don't have the priesthood in the home. When my sister's son finally became a deacon, it was like, oh, the priesthood's back in your home. But yet she was endowed. She she had the priesthood in her home the entire time. The the power and authority of the priesthood. I I think that's a maybe it's because we Barb and you could probably speak to this as we go through the section. But maybe it's because in the I don't know the last I don't know however long we've said we've just made men priesthood. We've just exchanged those two words. The men in the church are the priesthood of the church. Right. But there was a time in the church where not every man got priesthood, became a, you know, an elder or bishop. John, didn't someone teach us earlier that you would have an entire congregation and two elders and a bishop, right? Or two elders or, and, a, yeah. and, a, and a teacher uh, and the whole thing. Thank you, Hank. And I, I remember, was it in the, when Elder Oaks's talk, when he said it, it'd be improper to say, we'll now have the priesthood pass the sacrament? Was it, was it he who said that? Yeah. Because, because yep. no, that's not what happens. There's people who hold the priesthood might pass the sacrament, but referring, and that that's th those kind of things are very helpful. Men are not the priesthood, <laughs> and uh, I, th I thought that talk of Elder Oaks was wonderful. Where he said we talked about this phrase, where he said when a woman is set apart to do her calling, or as a missionary, uh, she is set apart with priesthood authority. And then he said, what other authority could it be? And that was one of those moments where, well, of course, if you're doing God's work, you're using the power of God. What would you call that? <laughs> yeah. You know? And John, that, that becomes important because, again, that's the ecclesiastical structure that we're talking about. When President Oak says when women are set apart to, to, a, to a calling, they have priesthood authority and they have power because of their righteousness. Well, what other priesthood authority would it be? That's the authority of the priesthood that comes through mm -hmm. the keys of one who is either a bishop or a state president or in some ecclesiastical role. You don't receive priesthood authority and priesthood. You don't receive priesthood power in the temple through priesthood keys. You receive priesthood power and authority in the temple through your covenants. So it's very different when you look at how how this process is moving forward. And so understanding again that relationship is important. That, that's why, for example, you're getting into, you know, you look back to section eighty four. We're talking about Moses and how he receives this priesthood, and you see this whole father to son relationship. And I remember. One day I was asked to explain this and I could not explain it. This patriarch, this idea of patriarchal order for some women is very difficult because patriarchal seems a little bit patronizing as if men again are in charge. And I love President, President Benson where he says, we call it the patriarchal order of the priesthood because it's passed on from father to son. But that does not mean that it's not a family priesthood. He actually says Adam and Eve together entered into this patriarchal order. Both of them have the power and authority associated with the patriarchal order of the priesthood. And he says a better term for it would be familial governments rather than patriarchal mm. priesthood. Oh, which, wow. Which is really a beautiful statement from him. Mm -hmm. That comes, by the way, from a great talk that I highly recommend to anybody who is studying this subject. Um, it's what I wish you, were, you would teach your children about the temple from President, President Benson. Elder Bednar quoted heavily out of that talk in his last in his last talk on the temple and trying to help us understand the temple better. That's that's a heavily quoted talk. It was given in the Logan Temple years ago or Logan, Logan Tabernacle, I believe, years ago. But it's a phenomenal talk on this topic. I can't be exalted without my wife. She can't be exalted without me. This is all about family. And so no wonder Satan is trying to divide so much because we need each other. The talk is entitled, What I Hope You Teach Your Children and Grandchildren About the Temple. It's April 1985 in the Logan Temple. And he says this, Adam and his descendants entered into the priesthood order of God. Today, we would say that they, they went to the house of the Lord and received their blessings. The order of the priesthood spoken of in the scriptures is sometimes referred to as the patriarchal order because it came down from father to son. 
but this order is otherwise described in modern revelation as an order of family government, where a man and a woman enter into a covenant with God, just as did Adam and Eve sealed for eternity to have posterity and to do the will and the work of God throughout their mortality. It's, it's similar to what President or Elder McConkie teaches about the Abrahamic covenant. He says there would be no Abrahamic covenant if there was no Sarah. It, you, it, it's, it's a couple, it's a yeah. family relationship. So we, I mean, we could say it's the Abrahamic and Sariah co- covenant if we really wanted to, but scripturally we mm-hmm. say it's the Abrahamic covenant. When you're talking about the patriarchal order of the priesthood and you're talking about sections of the doctrine and covenants, um, we're talking about family. We're talking about the gathering of Israel. We're talking Absolutely. about creating Zion. We're talking about becoming gods and goddesses. We're talking about, as we get into sections 128 later on in the Doctrine and Covenants, they receive their exaltation, meaning husband and wife. They become gods and goddesses. Husbands and wives together become that. And so regardless of, of marital status right now, for a man or a woman to enter into the patriarchal order of the priesthood and become gods and goddesses, they have to make and keep these covenants, whether in this life or in the next, which is absolutely significant when you're looking at section 84, because these promises that are going to be given to both women and men are only associated with those who enter into this order of the priesthood. It's, it's that understanding that order of the priesthood is a lot more important than people realize. You have to understand the temple in order to understand this section. But as, as paying the price, as President Nelson says, to spend time in the temple where the Lord does his teaching is critical to understanding Section 84. Yeah, I, I, this would change everything. It changes your paradigm because you would say, oh, you know, just like the bishop presides over the ward, the father presides over the family. And that's not the case. You're taking the structural priesthood, the administrative part. And moving it over into the family. And that's, you're saying, no, that's not how it works. Um, You need to understand this patriarchal priesthood, this familial government. Yeah, I mean, you look at some of these things. And and again, this is a little bit hard because because some things we would like to discuss in the temple that perhaps are, are sacred and difficult to discuss outside of the temple. But if you carefully look at this section, for those of you who have received your endowments, and for those of you who haven't, you can still see through temple eyes some of these things just from the Old Testament and from the and from the Pearl Great Price and other areas. But when you think about verse 19, for example, P- President Nelson says that both women and men are not using the priesthood privileges that could be theirs. And then he tells them mm-hmm. to study 19 through 22 specifically. It's not just men aren't understanding their priesthood privileges. Women aren't. And where do women receive their priesthood privileges? In the temple, right? So this is all temple. So you go to verse 19, the greater priesthood administereth the gospel and, and holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom of God, or the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. So some people would look at that and say, well, we're talking about keys. So that's definitely got to be the, be men, right? Because keys are men. No, keys are not men. This isn't talking about, this isn't talking about a position in the church. They're not called to be an apostle. They're not called to have a, a, a presiding stewardship. They are given the key of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. In fact, President Benson in that same talk says, both women and men receive the key of the mysteries of the kingdom of God in the temple. So this becomes extremely important in in verse 19, for example, because this talks about um, this priesthood structure. And we're talking again about this patriarchal priesthood structure. But we're talking about in verse 19, where President, President Nelson recently asked both the women and the men of the church to study section 84. In fact, to the, to the men of the church and the priestess session of the church, he actually said to the men that both women and men do not understand their priesthood privileges. And he asked them to study. And if you go to the footnote, he specifically asked the men to study section 84 verses 19 through 22. Then in section in 2019, President Nelson gives the same invitation to the women of the church and asks them to read section 84 to better understand their priesthood power and authority. So this becomes extremely important. President Nelson in the, in the last couple of years has invited, the last few years has invited both the men and the women of the church to study section 84 in regards to the priesthood. So what are these privileges that we may be missing? Well, in verse 19, the prophet or the Lord talks about the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. So for many women and men, sometimes we think about keys, we think about presiding. In this case, we're not talking about presiding at all. We're talking about a blessing that comes from one who makes and keeps temple covenants. And so, for example, in verse 19, that key of the knowledge of God, President President Benson actually says, when you attend the temple and perform ordinances that pertain to the house of the Lord, certain blessings come to you. He, He gives a few. And then he says, in the temple, you will receive the key of the knowledge of God. You will learn how you can be like him. Even the power of godliness will be manifest to you. 
So when we look at this, I hope that we understand in the temple, and you think about what the prophets and the leaders of the church have taught about the temple. The temple is where we receive the knowledge of God. It's where we receive and have the key of the knowledge of God and where we learn to become like God and have them, therefore, the power of godliness in our lives. And then we continue on talking about the ordinances and the authority given specifically in regards to the temple. And then you see in verse 22, for without this, no man can see the face of God, even the father and live. And where are we taught to see the face of God and where are we taught to be in his presence? Again, this is the temple. Right. So this this whole section is things that we're missing. We're talking about the temple. And that's why we continue on where we where we talked about before about Moses. Moses lost these temple ordinances. Moses lost this power. The people lost this 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 ability to see the face of God because they lost the patriarchal order of the priesthood. They no longer had the ability to enter into the temple and make and keep those sacred covenants associated with this highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood. So then it's the lesser order of the priesthood then that we have. And we talk about that starting in verse 26. Barb, how much do you think Joseph Smith, <laughs> it's just, you can see the Lord laying the groundwork here. And I wonder if he's saying these things, not quite understanding what they mean, <laughs> right? Because he's not going to have the yeah. Kirtland Temple for another, you know, this is, we're four years away from the dedication of the Kirtland Temple still. So I wonder if he's saying some of these things and, and he's going, I can't wait to find out what, what all this means, right? I don't want to say poor Joseph, but talk about a mind blowing experience on a regular right. basis. I mean, it's so fascinating. And he just keeps saying, you know, we, we, we need to learn more. We need to learn more. And then Joseph actually says, we cannot learn more about this higher order of the priesthood until we build a temple. Mm. We have to build a temple in, in order to learn this. But then I think for women, this becomes extremely important because the men receive their endowment in, in 1842. It's, it's, it's six years after, after the keys are restored in the Kirtland Temple, right? Then finally, they're starting to move to Nauvoo and, and Joseph and some of the men, some elect men are receiving these keys. But Joseph says, we cannot still have the fullness until the women receive this priesthood. And it was because of that, that the Relief Society has started. And the Relief Society is what prepares women to be able to enter the temple. And as you go through those early Relief Society minutes, Joseph is clearly re helping the women to enter into the order of the patriarch, enter into the patriarchal order of the priesthood with the men. And he says the men can't have it without the women. The women can't have it without the men. And therefore, we need both to enter into the temple. He was he was so forward thinking. Um, so Joseph talks about in the, in the book, Daughters of My Kingdom, Joseph, Joseph has a statement, first of all, the key of knowledge. And then he says... The purpose of organizing Relief Society was to give, this is from Daughters of My Kingdom, was to give the women the responsibility to help each other prepare for greater blessings of the priesthood found in the ordinances and covenants of the temple. If, if I, I wish I could pull out all these quotes right now, but this is a great place to find, find quotes and understanding on this is um, mm. the book from the Church History Department. Well, actually, I would give you two references. Um, one is, actually, I can give you three ref references. The book Daughters in My Kingdom is okay, so one, that's one, one source. That's a great reference. Daughters in My Kingdom, that's an official church. Yeah. And then the other one is Women of the Covenant. It's the Story Relief Society. That's another place where Joseph talks very specifically about the purpose of Relief Society and women and how they have to come in together to have the fullness of the priesthood. Um, actually, there are so many. Um, President Benson actually talks about that same idea there. And then in the early minutes, Joseph Smith talks, uh, Joseph Smith's, what do they call them? Minutes? I guess I should say the minutes of the Relief Society, Joseph Smith's accounts to the Women of Relief Society. You can actually find the minutes on the josephsmithpapers.org. Um, there's also a great book by Sherry Dew and Virginia Pierce Hinckley Cowley um, that also go through carefully and, and discuss the minutes of that book as well that I would recommend. What? Okay. Can you just kind of one more time restate the, the, the gist of that? We can't so basically, keep... Basically, there, there are two ideas. The first one is... In order to receive the fullness of the priesthood, we must have a temple, right? So we have to have the temple in order to receive the patriarchal order of the priesthood. We cannot enter into the patriarchal priesthood unless we have both men and women together. And so the purpose of the Relief Society was to prepare the women to enter into the temple, which is why in these early days of Relief Society, they were called, these women were actually called priestesses, and they were actually given that responsibility. These, these were women and men coming together in order to enter into the fullness of the priesthood. If you, I mean, you, even just studying the scriptures, you can find so much more on this topic regarding women and men together. Section, section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants talks about um, what we talked about before. 
Um, then shall they be gods because they have no, they have no end. Therefore they shall be from everlasting to everlasting because they continue. It's talking about husband and wife. This whole section is about husband and wife and being sealed. Again, a man can't be sealed and receive the patriarchal blessing, patriarchal priesthood, unless he has been sealed to a woman, neither can a woman to a man. It's, it's all throughout the scripture. Section 131 of the Doctrine and Covenants as well talks about verse two. In order to enter into the highest, a man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And then another name for the new and everlasting covenant of marriage is the patriarchal priesthood. Uh, and if he does not, he cannot obtain it. He may enter into the other, but th th but that is that is the end of his kingdom. He cannot have an increase. So it's this continuing on of this, this holy priesthood is impossible for a man to be saved in ignorance. And it talks more about the priesthood there. If you go throughout the Doctrine and Covenants and you just follow through temple ceilings, marriage, endowments, and authority, and things of that nature, you're going to see the progression between women and men and receiving their priesthood uh, ordinances. Sorry, awesome. their priesthood covenants and ordinances associated with it. I, I, I recognize it in, in talking about this. I, I get kind of excited about it. But when you start really looking at it, it becomes very clear what the Lord is trying to do. The Lord is trying to create eternal families. And the patriarchal order yeah. of the priesthood is how God creates eternal families. And so section 84 is a temple section regarding how to create eternal families. The, the women were referred to as priestesses um, in some of the meetings. So, so the women were actually referred to as deaconesses, priestesses. Uh, uh, the early days, they were, it, was, it was known as the anointed quorum. Both women and men together who had, mm. who had entered into the patriarchal order of the priesthood were known as the anointed quorum. When, re when reference to the temple, when you're talking about women, they are being uh, given positions in the temple that allows them to have this temple authority and this temple and this priesthood power. And so that's what we're really, section 84, yeah. that's what we're really talking about here. Which is a little bit difficult to talk about outside the temple, but it's important to know, though, that this is patriarchal priesthood. So, Barb, if a young women's leader or Relief Society teacher said, oh, the lesson's on the priesthood this month, we don't really need this, how would you feel about that? Would you be... You... <laughs> 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 Gee, let, let's take a guess. Yeah. Wow, I, I I would say you know what I appreciate that, but we do know that you you as a teacher have been given priesthood power and authority first of all, right? And I hope that you recognize if you're teaching young women, they have all made covenants with the Lord through baptism, and therefore, just as it says in verse thirty, they have received the blessings of the lesser priesthood, including the key. They have received the blessings of the lesser priesthood, including the ministering of angels. They, in this case, they haven't received the key because that is specifically related to the lesser priesthood, but they have received the ministering of angels because as President Oaks again says, any person who makes a covenant with God um, receives the blessings of the priesthood and those who have made the baptismal covenant specifically are promised that they would have the Holy Ghost with them. Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost and therefore they have the ministering of angels. So what a difference it would make in the lives of these young women if a young woman leader would say, Although the although the deacon although the Aaronic priesthood has been ordained or given the key of the ministering of angels, uh, keys open doors, and so what do you have when you take the sacrament? You have the ministering of angels. The key opens the door to the ministering of angels. But when you make and keep sacred covenants with the Lord, including the baptism covenant, and therefore every time you're taking of the sacrament, you're renewing the covenant, and therefore God is blessing you with the ministering of angels. So what a difference it would make for a, you know, a 16 year old young woman going to school, knowing that not only does she have these, this, this ministering of angels, but as it says later in verse 88 of the section, um, and whoso receiveth you there, I will be also, for I will go before your face. I will be on your right hand and on your left and on my, and my spirit shall be in your hearts and my angels round about you to bear you up. So women and men both have angels on their left hand and on their right hand round about us to bear us up. That that's critical for a young woman going on a mission for the first time, leaving her family for the first time, going to a movie theater, going on her first date, uh, babysitting at some unknown house for the first time, just walking down the street to know that because of her covenants, the Lord has promised her angels to be around her. No, no young woman is ever alone. My daughter is on week two of her mission. My second daughter right now. So, of course, angels are on your right hand and on your left. You're a missionary. And, and that's true, John, except I will say that even for me as a young woman and many young women that I've talked to, they don't know what does and doesn't apply to them. Yeah. I'm going to try to summarize here. If I take part in an ordinance and make covenants through the priesthood, 
I then have priesthood power regardless of my gender. Absolutely. Your priesthood power is associated with the covenants that you make and your righteousness, just like for a man and a woman are the same thing. So a woman, if a woman is, is going to the temple and she is making covenants in the temple, but she comes home and she's abusive and yelling and fighting, just like, just like a husband, maybe she loses priesthood power based upon her righteousness and her purity. But if a woman goes to the temple and makes covenants with the Lord, just as a man who goes to the temple and makes covenants with the Lord and, and does his best to be Christ-like as he tries to, as he becomes more righteous, his priesthood power will increase. It's the same thing with women. Women's priesthood power increases the same way men's does. It's through righteousness. The authority is what's different. The authority, men receive authority through being ordained to a priesthood office in the church. That's the ecclesiastical structure. So a deacon does receive priesthood authority to be able to perform priesthood functions. Participating in the passing of the sacrament would be one of those priesthood functions. Um, baptism, baptizing someone would be a priesthood function. A woman will receive priesthood authority through her calling given to her by someone who holds priesthood keys. She's not ordained to the priestess, so therefore a 12-year-old girl does not have the authority to be involved in the sacrament like a 12-year-old boy, nor can an 18-year-old girl perhaps baptize because she hasn't been ordained a, a priest in the Aaronic priesthood. That is something that he has only been given authority to do. But she can participate in the saving of souls. She can participate in bringing people to Christ. She can participate in all that she needs to do under the authority given to her by, by the keys of, of the bishop or state president. And in addition, she has the authority of her covenants that come through her baptism and through, in this case, it could be her temple covenants at this point. So as we continue taking, making and keeping sacred covenants, our power increases as we are obedient. And the authority comes through the covenant and especially in the ecclesiastical through the person who has priesthood keys. Very good. And, Does that make sense? Um, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, this is making perfect sense. And uh, so just because my son has the ironic priesthood, when I'm out of town, he's not presiding in the home. He's not going to call on. He's not going to be the one calling on people to pray. He's uh, right. My wife is presiding in my in my home together. Right. It's not just when I'm gone. <laughs> well, I, Hank, you have to be a little bit careful with that because... Yeah, the, I want to be. I, I want to know what you think about that. Right. I, when we're talking about presiding, um, there is, it's, it, we're very specifically taught in, in the family proclamation that the man presides in the home. But often what is confusing with that term is what does it mean to preside? So um, Elton Perry has a, has a great quote where he says... Um, Remember, brethren, that in your role as a leader in the family, your wife is your companion. Since the beginning, God has instructed mankind that marriage should unite husband and wife together in unity. Therefore, there is not a president or a vice president in a family. The couple works together eternally for the good of the family. They are united together in word, in deed, and in action as they lead, guide, and direct their family unit. They are on equal footing. They plan and organize the affairs of the family jointly and unanimously as they move forward. So then you say, okay, well, then what is presiding? Because the world teaches us that presiding means you're in charge. Well, I don't find a single place in the scriptures or in any of the teachings of the prophets where it says the man is in charge. Traditionally, you can see some of that in the world. And traditionally, you could even see some of that in the church. But the brethren, especially of late, have been very clear that presiding doesn't mean you're in charge. In fact, in fact, recently, Elder Holland said presiding is to love, to serve, and to sacrifice. So... Um, when we're talking about Pre President Benson, I say unto you with all soberness, Jesus Christ is a model we must follow as we take the spiritual lead in our families. Especially this is important with your relationship with your wife. So, so we talk about this word presiding. We're not talking about somebody being in charge, ruling over. We're talking about two people that are equally yoked, that, that are to love and serve each other and their children. We talk about nurturing then, and we talk about the same thing with the family proclamation. Well, then what is nurturing? Well, a lot of people would say, well, nurturing means that you are in charge of changing diapers and making sure that there are clothes on your children. Well, President Eyring in 2018 actually says that women are the, are to be the, the principal gospel teachers in the home. That's what nurturing is. That's very different. If, if a woman's primary responsibility is to be a gospel instructor, that's a different definition of nurturing than the world gives. So again, when we're looking at these definitions, it's extremely important that we say, not what is the world teaching about the word preside and nurture and priesthood, but what is God teaching about priesthood, 
presiding and nurturing. Could we go with that to, um, does that fit nicely with the stripling warrior's mothers? Yeah, absolutely. Because that's, it wasn't just, they, they changed their, do they have loin, the stripling warriors have loin cloths, Hank? Um, loin cloth diapers. I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it was the, no, it was, they, uh, that's exactly what it says. They, they taught them. They taught them the gospel, right? So I like that. So President Eyring 2018 said nurturing is the primary gospel teacher. Did I get that right? I will actually find you the exact quote because I love this quote. When he yeah. said this, he was talking about President President Nelson in the same conference talked about how we as women need to have the courage of Mother Eve to make decisions that would impact our family for eternity, which... Again, this is a very Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints teaching that we have a prophet who is trying to tell us to become like Mother Eve, to yeah. have the courage oh, yeah. to make decisions. That's very, <laughs> right? That's very and uniquely us. <laughs> extremely uniquely us. And then just the idea that, and then he basically says in that same talk that Adam was wise enough to partake. Right? Follow her. Yeah. To follow her. And so she's nurturing in this case. This is her nurturing role to recognize the importance of what she's doing, to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and act in accordance that will save for eternity God's children, our heavenly parents' children. That's nurturing. So now we see, and and, and Adam was wise enough to partake, right? And that's, that's presiding and nurturing at its finest. They're working together as a couple. She didn't just nurture her children. She nurtured her husband. Oh, look at exactly. Moses. That verse in, was it Moses 5, like 10 and 11? It's like, <laughs> it's so funny to see to see what both of them say and how Eve get, seems to have a bigger picture than Adam does in Moses 5. Is it Moses 5, 10 and 11? Because of my transgression, my eyes are open. And Eve is like, because of our transgression, we, and she yeah. sees the big <laughs> family picture. I mean, you read it and she has a bigger and Elder Oaks has talked about that too, uh, her special perspective or something that in that episode of the fall. But I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I just finished um, a class for my students on, I call it our glorious mother Eve. And I was like, yes, go find me that phrase anywhere in traditional Christianity, our glorious mother Eve. You'll, you'll find it here. That's what God called her. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's not just some, that's not even, I mean, I don't want to minimize Joseph Smith. Those aren't Joseph's words. That's, that's what God called her glorious mother Eve. I mean, yeah. and a prophet today saying that we need to have the courage of mother courage Eve. to make decisions. Like, Oh, yep. I love, I got to, I'm going to put that in my, my I lesson. I can find that for you. That's, that's again, that's 2018, but this is a quote from president, president, um, Irene that I was referring to. He says, Part of the Lord's current sharing of knowledge relates to accelerating his pouring out eternal truth on the heads and to and the hearts of his people. He has made clear that the daughters of Heavenly Father will play a primary role in that miraculous acceleration. One evidence of the miracle is his leading his le is his leading his living prophets to put far greater emphasis on gospel instruction in the home and within the family. And we're definitely seeing this in COVID time. Who knew when the prophet was doing this, this was going to happen. So then he continues in the proclamation. He gave sisters charge to be the principal gospel educators in the family. That's that's a pretty strong statement. So when we're talking about nurturing, we're talking about principal gospel educators. We we often talk about how the how the father needs to take this role in teaching, but the father and the mother are a team. I mean, on a personal note, I miss my parents, but I if somebody were to say who was the principal gospel instructor, I would say both. I, I don't I, I I remember one time coming into my mother's room a, f a while after she had passed away. Her scriptures were still by her bed and, the, and her glasses were on top of it. And I remember walking over there and seeing dust. And it was the first time in my entire life that I ever saw a speck of dust on my mom's scriptures. She, she studied the scriptures and she taught mm. us from them. And I think about my dad and, you know, recently we've gone through my parents' scriptures and we're kind of d dividing them out between brothers and sisters and you open them up. My mom has probably a lot more writing in her scriptures. Uh, typically my dad's scriptures are just kind of highlighted here and there, but there's no question that they were a team and their use of the scriptures in order to help our family. She was nurturing. My father was presiding, but together they were completely united neither was in charge. They were, they were a team. They were a husband and wife that were preparing their children for hopeful exaltation. That's, that's what the patriarchal priesthood is about. That's what section 84 is about. It's, it's, it's people working together 
in order to bring us back to Christ. So Elder Talmadge has one of my all-time favorite quotes. He has a few regarding women, but I love this. Again, referring to temple and the covenants that we make and women. He says, In the glorified state of the blessed hereafter, husband and wife will administer in their respective stations, seeing and understanding alike, and cooperating to the full in the government of their family kingdom. I love that terminology, family kingdom. And then he says, Then shall women reign by divine right, a queen in the resplendent realm of her glorified state, even as exalted man shall stand priest and king unto the Most High God. Mortal eye cannot see nor mind comprehend the beauty, glory, and majesty of a righteous woman made perfect in the celestial kingdom. This Just this whole idea of husband and wife reigning together and the so glorified cool. state of both of these people. And I just, the beauty of this eternal family. We, I just don't, we, we, we have, there is so much more as President Nelson says that God is trying to show us and teach us. And this, this idea of this glorified state of the blessed hereafter. This is what we're talking about. This is why we're here. Glorified wow. individuals. I have a question then relating yeah. to this and then, um, John and I have both received this question before from wonderful, faithful women. Um, it's how I think I think this new view could change the not only the answer to the question, but even the not question. Even, yeah, it would change the question, yeah. which is how do I get my husband to preside, to gather us in family prayer, to teach us? How do I get him to to do that? I've received that question before. And it seems like what you're teaching here is change your question almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's not you're trying to get your husband. It's what can you do as a couple to draw closer to Christ so that together you can help your family. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I've, I've known some women in the past that they're, 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 they're almost nervous to become too righteous because they think in so doing they're going to lose their husband or they're going to leave him behind. Nothing could be further from the truth. The more righteous a woman is, and the more she tries to draw closer to the Lord, the Lord will guide her and give her through the spirit, through the power of the priesthood that she has, through the covenants that she has made, the the ability to know what to do. I, I mean, that's a promise again from President Nelson recently was we will know what we will, should do right through the priesthood. And so. So when you're talking to this woman and saying, you know, how do I get my husband to do this? You're not trying to get your husband to do things. You're together as a couple trying to be united. And so maybe a question could be, how can I better be united with my husband so that the two of us can draw our children unto Christ? That's, that's a different kind of question. It, it may be that that it's not a matter of just sitting back. There, there are so many answers to that question because every couple is different. My, my husband is very different than my father. My mom would respond probably different to my husband than, than my, than my, than I would to my husband, but my husband will respond differently to me. It's, it's a couple. And that's one of the reasons why that's a, such a private relationship. It's two people who have been in this case sealed in the temple with all of the promises associated with what we are talking about in section 128 that when that couple is sealed in the temple, they have, they have started an entirely new kingdom. And so it's that couple working together, those individuals coming together as a couple to figure out how they can make that happen. You're not just trying to get your husband to preside. You're trying to create an eternal family. You're trying to create an eternal couple. And so that takes a lot of humility. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of honesty. It takes a lot of becoming like Christ for both the wife and the husband. Christ had to wait a long time for us too. I can't tell you how many times, and it has gone both directions, that my wife will say like, oh, should we, let's gather everybody to pray. Or I say it, you know, she's like, hey, let's go get our pajamas on. And I'm like, oh, should we get everybody together to pray? And it's not like she's reminding me of my job or I'm reminding her of her job. It's we're trying to <laughs> It's what we other. do. It's yeah, what we do what at we the do. end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I really like, um, cause I've always understood preside, but when you use that phrase, uh, it's not a president and a vice president that is really helpful because, cause I don't see it that way in our family at, at all. <laughs> and, uh, I, I get the word preside, but if you equate it with president, then it does sound like there's a vice president and that that's not what, 
what we're after. We're equal partners. And sometimes it will be, oh, we got to have family prayer uh, for me. Or sometimes it will be, we got to have family prayer from my wife. And that's how it's supposed to work. We're both doing this. It's like the vice presider. I'd never thought of that before. You know, you know I, I've, I've thought about this a lot. And some people have asked, you know, what does it look like? And, and this sounds like almost a cop out, but I will just say it like this. When you see it, you know it. When you feel it, you know it. You know what it's like to have a righteous man presiding in your home or in your family. And if you don't know, then find it for a man or a woman. Both of uh, both genders can be looking for examples, but we know what it's like. I can I can imagine what it's like for President Nelson to be presiding, quote unquote, in his family. Uh, he's married to a very strong woman. Uh, who who has very strong opinions too, but I I promise you that those those guys those two are pre, he is presiding and she is nurturing in love and righteousness. When, when I when I think about this, I, I think about a time when I was on a church history trip with my family, and we were going across Martin's Cove, and we got up you know to the Rocky Ridge area, and coming back down, and we went to the to the grave site where the where you have the big the big wheel and the bear, the bodies buried there and. And I remember looking at the stone and just seeing uh, the, the the numbers of genders that were buried. For whatever reason, that caught my attention as a as a young teenager. And I remember asking my mom, "Mom, why are there more men than women that have that have that are here? Like the men are stronger. Men men have you know bigger muscles, and they could have gotten across this plane so well." And my mom said, and and to this day, it 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 is it rings so true because. Men, righteous men will always sacrifice for others. There were more men passing away because the men were giving their food. The men were pulling these handcarts. Remember, doing, and so were the women. But the men who presided gave their lives for their families. They weren't trying to be in control. They were trying to save. They were trying to exalt. And that's what a presiding man does. No woman would be afraid of the term preside or find it demeaning if she really understood what a true presider is like. In my life, I've been blessed by that. And I, and I'm almost hesitant to say that because, well, frankly, I wasn't married till I was 40 and I, I didn't have a husband in my family, but I sure watched a lot of righteous men, home teachers, bishops, my own father, people that I taught with. Pre- presiding is a very holy, sacred responsibility for men. And it's not what the world would have us believe. And frankly, Satan would love to make us hate that word. It is a very right. Our father in heaven presides, but I don't think our mother in heaven is just doing whatever he says. They are a couple united for the purpose of exal- exalting their children. It's righteous. It's It's powerful. So I think when we talk about these words and we talk about this section of the Doctrine and Covenants again, I think the Lord is really trying to help us to see these people are brought into the presence of God. A, a person, when you're, when you're bringing a husband and wife into the presence of God to see his face, they aren't just standing in pride. They're kneeling in righteousness. And that's why they weren't ready yet. They weren't ready to kneel and see God's face yet. And that's part of this couple coming together is as we are trying to become gods and goddesses, we have to lose all of those sharp points in our lives and become like Christ, which the priesthood gives us that opportunity to do. Our priesthood and our covenants, right? Yeah. So I, I've, I've always loved this quote. It's tying in the patriarchal priesthood with the temple. Joseph Smith says, go through and finish the temple and God will fill it with power. And you will then receive more knowledge concerning this priesthood. There's only one place where the order of the priesthood, which is patriarchal authority, is made known, and that is in the temple. You enter into an order of the priesthood in the temple. I just I just love here where Joseph Smith is very explicit and he's simply saying that we're talking about the patriarchal order of the priesthood, and the patriarchal order of the priesthood is only found in the temple, and that's why we need temples built. And again, that's why we need temples built throughout the world today is because it's all about creating eternal families, and eternal families are made in temples. Well, and I, and I think, you know, we talk about the Aaronic priesthood and how important it is. I, I hope in all of this, we aren't dismissing the importance of the Aaronic priesthood because there would be no repentance. There would be no baptism. There would be no remission of sins if we did not have uh, the Aaronic priesthood. And so all of this becomes important as well. But I, I will continually say that remember in all of these things, although the young men have the key or have been blessed with the key, although the bishop has this key in this case, 
All women and all men are receiving these blessings. All of them are able to repent. All of them are able to be baptized. So again, President Nelson says that, oh, how he wishes that the women would understand how relevant the restoration of the priesthood is in their lives. Well, it is just as relevant to the young women as it is to the young men. Sometimes traditionally we teach that it's kind of skewed. I mean, sometimes we'll have the priesthood camp and we'll have a father's and son's outing and call it the priesthood overnighter or something. Well, it's no different, frankly, than having a woman go with her daughter. We could call that the priesthood overnighter too, depending on the definition of priesthood that you're using. Okay, so in the introduction to the 2020 handbook, um, there's actually been a change in this introduction, which is extremely significant. It's not a change in the doctrine. The priesthood itself is the doctrine. But this is a change in our understanding of, of this doctrine. It simply says this. The priesthood is the authority and power of God. That's the same. It has always existed and will continue to exist without end. Now, now note this. Through the priesthood, Heavenly Father accomplishes His work to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. God grants authority and power to His sons and daughters on earth to help carry out this work. And until 2020, I have never seen the word daughters in there. But there has been a very strong emphasis from our prophet today to help the young women and the women of the church understand that they have priesthood power and authority. So it is therefore related and kind of gone through that in their most recent handbook of instruction, no longer does it say man as if man could be both genders. It is actually specifically stating sons and daughters so that the women understand that they also have this priesthood power and authority. That's a critical point for, for our women and men of the church to understand. Exactly. Um, and I think if we don't, there's a danger here, Barb. If we don't understand this, we're going to end up teaching, we're going to pass down some false traditions. One of those could be, and what would you say to this? That somehow a, a young man has it in his head that because he is a holder of the priesthood and he's, you know, he's 14 or 15 and the young women in his ward who are also his same age, 14 or 15, that somehow he has more decision-making authority than these young women, how do we, that seems to me a pretty damaging result of not understanding. Again, that's something that's very traditional. I mean, <laughs> we, we teach so much the importance of keys and, and priesthood responsibility and authority, and that is so traditionally tied to men. And, and, and it's true, women, men, men preside in the church. There is a prophet and he is a man. And that is, that is the way God has organized it. President, President Hinckley was one time asked, why is it that men are ordained to priesthood offices and not women? And his answer was, I don't know. <laughs> Just, we don't know. And I love that answer. There are so many bad answers to that question. And I hear it taught so many times. I appreciate Elder Oaks' statement where he says, one of the biggest problems we have in the church is giving answers to questions that God has never revealed. Amen. So let's yeah. not give the reasons. So, so yeah. Um, traditionally you see, not just traditionally, but in the church, you do see in the hierarchical structure of the church that you do have men who are presiding in specific responsibilities. So first presidency, quorum of the 12, you know, presidency of the 70 president, stake president, bishop, those, those men have keys and they do so hopefully in, in great righteousness, wield an authority and have, have great influence. But if you look at these righteous, wise men, you look, president, president Ballard has spoken so much regarding this. A very wise priesthood holy man who holds keys will turn to the Relief Society president and ask for her opinion on things and take it very take her her opinion very carefully and very seriously. So we look at a young man. Well, young men traditionally for some reason have have thought, and you brought up that before, that you know, if a young man is the one in the home and the and, and he has been ordained to a priesthood office, then he presides. Well, of course he doesn't. That that we know. President Oaks recently has clarified that very carefully. But in the church, sometimes we think that if a man is ordained to a priesthood office, therefore he is going to preside over the women at church. That's not the case. If, let's say, a 17-year-old young man and a 17-year-old young woman were called for whatever reason to, um, to be in charge of the trek, the stake trek, and no one else was in that room, who presides in that meeting? Well, both. Or neither. Yeah. You both because, are either, yeah. Because the presiding comes from one who has priesthood keys. The bishop could have said, you know, Jenny, you're going to be in this meeting with John and you're presiding. And that would have been fine because the presiding isn't a priesthood office. A priest, it, isn't, it isn't related specifically to the priesthood unless the priesthood holder, the key holder, is actually making that delegation. If two, if a husband and wife were called to be teachers of a Sunday school class, say that they were called to work in the primary. Well, who presides in that class? Well, both. 
because this is a calling. They're no longer at home, right? So now they're at church. They're both called by one who has priesthood keys, the bishop. And so they are both given equal authority. It's extremely important. In fact, I've asked many, many students over the years, similar questions to this. And most of the time until recently, they've been very wrong. So it's a tradition that we, <laughs> that we need to work on <laughs> for sure. You feel like we're, we're turning a corner though. We're starting to yeah, and, and just and just for the purposes of, of our discussion, I, I hope we recognize this isn't a problem just in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I don't even want to call it a problem. This isn't just an issue. This is, I mean, I serve as a chaplain. This is a this is a tendency throughout most religions. This is a tendency throughout the world. I mean, we have been working on women's rights and women's issues for for years and years and years and years. And like I've said before, Joseph Joseph Smith was very forward thinking. We have a prophet today who is very forward thinking. President Nelson has opened the doors and, and turned the keys to women in ways that, that we have not seen in years. But, but this is not a problem of, of just our church. This isn't the struggle that just women of the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints have. This is, this is something that is very cultural. And I think our prophet is helping us to get out of the culture and into the gospel. And how would you explain to a young woman why um, it didn't start out this way, right? Like, why didn't it, why, why didn't when, right when the church is organized, did the Lord, you know, it, it's pretty much here, here it is in 1832. But well, I get that sometimes from students is if it's the Lord's church, why does it have to learn, <laughs> right? The, the Lord could, could tell me that I should use calculus today. But unless I started with basic one plus one, mathematics, I would never be able to do calculus. Mm -hmm. So even though he could reveal calculus to me, I still need to practice basic mathematics skills to get there. Line upon and line. Line upon line, precept upon precept. We talk about this so often and people say, well, why didn't the Lord just tell the women? Well, what would have happened in that day? And what, what would have happened in, in the 1860s? And what would have happened in the 1920s? I mean, you think about the world in progression. God is very wise in teaching line upon line. These doctrines and these, these principles that are set here are in the scriptures. This is, this is straight 1830s. It is so there and it is very clear. I mean, he is establishing the Relief Society with the intent that women are going to receive their endowments and receive power and authority. It was taught in Nauvoo in the 1840s, very clearly to these women. They understood it. They pass it along. Eliza Snow passes it. You see these all through these women of the church. But it's as if we as a culture are trying to catch up to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's been there all along. We're just finally to the point where we're really figuring it out. And we have a prophet who is making it a, a, a key emphasis today. Right. President Nelson in the last three years has asked the women of the church to study priesthood power and authority two times consecutively in general conference. He doesn't do that typically repeat himself, but he actually says, I repeat my plea for the women of the church to study priesthood power. That that's, that's uncommon. And then he gives them specific instruction on how to do that. That was 2019 and 2020. President Nelson has done that. And, and, yeah. and, you know, sometimes women struggle with that because they think, well, if women are studying priesthood power and authority, maybe they're trying to be ordained to a priesthood office. There, there are a number of reasons why, why women don't study that. And many of it is just because there's a culture of if women try to study it, then they are trying to change the prophet. No, the prophet is the one asking. <laughs> so it's important for the men to help the women also to understand, because if there is not a supportive man behind us, a woman who's trying to follow the prophet, it's very difficult. If a man says to a woman, why are you studying the priesthood? Uh, are, are you trying to be ordained to a priesthood office? Well, it, he just slammed that woman down pretty hard, even though he may not have meant intended that. The smallest nuance of negativity in this topic is extremely damning to women because it has been a hot topic and many people have struggled with it over the years. So in this topic, as we're studying Section 84, it's extremely important that that questions are allowed and and asked for, that testimonies are born, that that we understand that we have a literally a prophet of the church today who is pleading using the word pleading coming from him for the women of the church to understand their role in the priesthood. So it's important that the men understand that, that that is the, that is the direction that the women have been given by the prophet. Please join us for part two of this podcast.